liftoff. The exhaust gases that generate thrust also generate phenomenal sound energy. This is so powerful, it can have fatal consequences. And this is the launch pad where it all happens. During a launch, this place is just alive with energy. Flames, searing gases, incredible amounts of noise. I'm underneath where the shuttle sits on the launch pad. This is the flame trench. I can only be here because the shuttle isn't in place right now. You certainly wouldn't want to be here when the countdown hits zero. And this trench was used in some Apollo missions as well. So to think of the incredible amounts of energy that these walls have taken over the years, it kind of boggles the mind. The firing rockets create a thunderous sound that slams into the bottom of this trench. This sound is energy. And systems engineer John Lorch knows how powerful this can be. Even way back, three miles away, you can feel that energy just popping in your chest, you know, and, and it's just amazing the amount of energy. Unchecked, all this energy would bounce off the ground straight back up towards the shuttle. The vibrations would be so powerful, they would wreak havoc. On the first ever shuttle mission, they ripped heat-resistant tiles off the surface of the orbiter. That time, the orbiter returned to Earth safely, but it could have burnt up on re-entry. So the engineers needed to find a way to protect the shuttle from reflected energy. To do that, they had to absorb the sound energy that roared down here and then bounced back up and hit the shuttle itself. Back at the Hammond Space Centre UK, I can't replicate the shuttle's thunderous sound. But I can give you a taste of its destructive power. I'm going to build a wall here, and then I'm going to knock it over with a pulse just of air. Like that, only bigger. A lot bigger. I'll just use the half one on the end. Look, I made a neat job of that. That's the wall built. And over here is what I hope is going to blow it over. A vortex cannon. First, we need to do a little test run. Three, two, one. That is up there and makes the most amazing things I've ever seen. <laughs> An explosion in the base of the cannon creates a single pulse of air the shape of a donut. Unlike sound that moves in a wave, the vortex flies through the air like a missile. The vortex has a lot of energy, but can it knock over my wall? So Jim's now charging it with acetylene. Ready to make our explosion. Don't ever do it, will you? This is going to have to be one hefty puff of air. Thank you very much. If we're ready, everyone, in three, two, one. It's just air. In slow motion, we can see the vortex as it travels through the air at over 200 miles an hour. And as you can see, it creates a fair amount of destruction. The shuttle's problem is much bigger. Its exhaust gases jet out at about two and a half thousand miles an hour, producing vast amounts of sound energy as vibrations. The engineers needed to find a way to protect the shuttle. 
NASA turned to a system that connects the shuttle to U-boats via bubbles. Acoustics expert Tim Layton from the University of Southampton shows me how. What we have here is our very own mini sonar system. A tube of water, a speaker at the bottom that plays cheeps of sound, and at the top, a special underwater microphone that will pick them up. You can hear the sound cheeps, and they're represented on screen here. I'm going to introduce bubbles in here, because bubbles are really powerful at absorbing sound. So here right. we go. So this is the key thing to watch. That cheap is going to disappear. All right. So here we go. So you're literally just blowing bubbles into just it blowing, with the machine. Yeah. All right, I can hear that. But look at the screen. It's gone. The bubbles that you can see in the pipe are killing off that sound entirely. We're still playing the sound cheeps through the water, but even the smallest bubbles are stopping the microphone from picking them up. There's nothing and it's in still there gone. Now. We still wait. Are they enough to stop it? Yep. But there's hardly any. So these tiny, tiny, yep. almost microscopic bubbles are killing are off all that sound. Completely killing the sound on there. The bubbles soak up the sound by getting hot. So, literally, then, the, the sound leaves here, which is just yep. this wave, this, this movement coming up through here. Yep. When it encounters bubbles of air in the water, yep. the wave squashes the bubbles yep. of air. That heats them up. Yep. So the energy in the sound wave is turned into energy heat. in heat. So bubbles absorb sound. But how does that help submarines? World War II, the German U-boat fleet is under attack. The Germans want to make their subs untraceable to the Allied destroyers and their sonar systems. The Allied sonar worked by sending out sound cheeps from their ships and then waiting for the echo to bounce back from a solid object. This could tell them where the German subs were. If the Germans could absorb the sonar cheeps, no echo. They would be invisible. So they created rubber tiles to glue to the sides of their subs. Tiles with bubbles in them. This, and this is a genuine uh, World War II uh, lining from a uh, German submarine. And you see it's stuck onto the submarine this way. This side is smooth, but this side has holes in, has voids in. The holes trap air, creating thousands of little bubbles. When a sonar ping comes and hits this, these absorb the sound in the same way that those bubbles did. So bubbles can make German U-boats invisible. But the shuttle isn't underwater, obviously. And it has a bit more than just cheeps of sound to deal with. To absorb the phenomenal noise of firing rocket engines, NASA turns sound absorption on its head. Instead of air in water, they put water in air. Tim's got another tube with just air in it. We're still sending cheeps of sound through it. But this time we're going to try to block them with a mist of water droplets. This one into uh, this one. Water yeah? into ice. OK, so pour that in there. And it makes fog. Can't really see where I'm pouring. Hopefully that's into the tube. Yeah, it's going in, isn't it? feel like a wizard. And my spell seems to be working. Oh, look at that! Absolutely knocked it right back. So this is just fog. I'm not tipping the actual water in. The microscopic droplets of water in the air are vibrating, turning the sound energy into heat. NASA protects the orbiter in pretty much the same way. Though needless to say, NASA's system is a bit more complicated. It looks like a warehouse. It's actually the mobile launcher platform. The shuttle assembly sits on top. Those three, one, two, three, they're the rainbirds. And at peak flow, nine seconds after launch, water hurtles through those at a rate of 900,000 gallons. That's three and a half million litres a minute. Releasing so much water so quickly through the rainbirds forms millions of water droplets suspended in air. And it's these water drops that absorb the phenomenal sound energy. 
the system for unleashing that amount of water is unbelievably simple. A water tower. At heart, this is essentially a really big version of the kind of water tank you'd see outside a town or a city. This is really just an elegant, simple design to get that flow rate we need. When the valves open, more than a million litres of water plummets. It sprays beneath the rocket engines and absorbs the thunderous sound. So, can water work against the Vortex Cannon? Time to see if what's good enough for the shuttle is good enough for my wall. First, obviously, we've got to rebuild it. Next, we need water. This is our rainbird. The blast I'm about to fire has exactly the same power as before. But this time, there's a curtain of water between the cannon and the blocks. OK, if we're ready, everybody, in three, two, one. In slow motion, you can see how the pulse of air hits the water and loses energy. Well, look at that. I think we can safely say, top marks, NASA, well done. Their theory works, as I just proved. They'll be grateful. I mean, it really did work.